Hello beautiful people, one quick announcement, I recently hired a marketing guy and he told me two things. Firstly, he told me, Charlie, what the fuck are you doing? You've never done any marketing in your life, you're just leaving money out on the table, fair enough. Second of all, you're selling your content way too cheap, you're underselling yourself, man. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be packaging and bundling up a lot of my content and we're going to be selling it as a more holistic and expensive bundle. Uh, so you have four more days to buy the individualized content at a cheaper price. Second of all, what we've done is I've recorded a webinar on how to become a professional poker player crusher and it's for absolute free. So you can sign up on my website charliecarroll.com and you will receive in your email a webinar about how to become an absolute crusher. Enjoy the episode, you beautiful souls. Ladies and gentlemen, everything in between. It is finally time. Now, I've thought that it's been finally time many, many times. Here's hoping this is actually the final, finally time. I have not specifically got filming permission in a casino, but I have used my, my noggin and a little bit of my contacts and my persuasion, my silver tongue, to convince somebody on the inside to tip all of the dealers and staff to just look the other direction whilst I'm filming, to just pretend it ain't happened. I'm dressed for the occasion, it looks like we're gonna be playing one two because this casino only offers one two. But I've got a plan, and I need you, you sitting there, especially if you live in London, to come down to this casino. You can look at the name on the chips and everything as well. The, the person on the inside knows that it's a very good opportunity for people to have eyes on the casino for eventually we can do like home games together, you can play against me, you can learn a few tricks of the trade if you just sit down at a table with me. I, I've actually played a couple of sessions already. I think now I can film, my energy is gonna be good, I'm confident it's gonna be great content, and I can start teaching people again how to fucking crush these stakes and turn $10,000 into $100,000 prove the dream is still alive for you. Right. Peace and <laughs> love, guys. I love every single one of you. table maximum but it turns out you can actually match the biggest stack of the table so this one to it this casino and this poker room it plays big it ends up playing more like a two five by the end of the night as you'll see as the video goes on first hand we pick up there is a raise from mid position to 12 pounds the button calls and we call ace jack off in the big blind now i will add that not many people at the table know me which is you know, a bit of a humbling experience, but also very nice because usually at the Hippodrome or at the Vic when I've been playing, everyone knows who I am and it's harder for me to get away with shenanigans. Now, there has been a lot of talk in the casino that I've turned up, people looking at me, talking about me, but at this table specifically, people tended not to know who I was, so bear their minds for how we're perceived to play in this kind of spot. So the flop is King 10 5 Rainbow. Uh, we have a gut shot and an overcard, and it checks through. I'm not usually going to be leading this. There's too many ace, king, king, queen, king, jacks in my opponent's range. The turn is a three off suit. So there's a Badoogie board out there, no flush draws. I'm pretty sure my opponents haven't got a king or better. I'm pretty sure even that they don't have queens or jacks. Just looking at my opponent, uh, especially the one that raised early position. So I think this is a good time for an overbet. What I'm doing here is I'm targeting hands like ace queen, ace jack, 10 9, you know, queen 10, ace 10, and putting pretty much all of those in a dicey spot in the turn. Obviously, if they decide to call, then we have some outs to improve. Uh, but I like to do this when I'm the only person in the hand that doesn't have a capped range. I like to make a very obvious overbet. I tend to not want to bluff too huge. But in relation to the game, 40 pounds is still pretty small, even though it's big in relation to the pot. So we get two folds and we take it down. I wanted to throw this one in there just to show an example of overbetting into a capped range. They have some pretty cool dealers, and this is Ettore, which is apparently the Italian way of saying Hector, doing what everyone was describing to me as the perfect shuffle. 
and I was very intrigued, so I had to see it for the vlog. Let me know what you guys think. He was a little bit nervous on the first couple of tries. On the third try, he absolutely nailed it. To me, this is super impressive, but I've never tried it. So tell me if it is as impressive as it looks. So we're about an hour into the session now, not much has happened. And I gotta admit, even though I'm having a really good time, I'm still feeling a little bit, it's not nerves, but there was just something off about my energy. Filming, not having like a stand for my phone and picking up and pointing, and being in an unfamiliar place, a lot of intense people around, a lot of eyes on me. It really was a little bit unsettling. You'd think I'd be used to it by now, but you know, as I've become a more and more sensitive person, it's more and more challenging. But at the same time, when I do get a, a control of my energy, my mind, my intuition is so much sharper than normal. So it, it really is a double-edged sword. Bearing in mind that this table is maybe one of the softest tables I've ever played done in my life <laughs> we get an open to our right to 10 pounds from two we have ace 10 suited in the cutoff and we make it 35 ace 10 suited against this opponent was the absolute nuts she was playing pretty loose not terribly loose but pretty loose and we get a cold call from the button bear in mind that this player last time we threw bet in a really small part he cold called queen they off suit out of the small blind so he could be really really wide here and we get a call from the hijack. The flop is king nine six one diamond rainbow. We are gonna be continuation betting here. Obviously giving up seems completely fine as well. It's a really coordinated boards. It's gonna be hitting our opponent's range, but because they're so loose, we might be up against, you know, like pocket deuces and ace five suited, there's ace jack, and you can name you can name a ton of hands that could be missing. So we're gonna go for a small continuation bet. We'll be going larger with value, just so you know. We get two calls, so we're off to the turn. The turn comes the eight of diamonds spicy we now have a gut shot and the nut flush draw what we really want to do is get two folds we don't want to have to hit our hand to win the pot so we have to think is there a size that's reasonable for us to go we can end up getting two folds you know what what's the best size to go here one of the issues about betting is that if we get raised we might be priced into call and we might end up having to put more money in whilst, whilst we're behind. However, I think because we're up against two people that seem to actually be pretty emotionally attached to their chips, it's not like they were just donating them away. I thought that with a turn bet into two people, we could actually sometimes get somebody off a hand like King 10, King Jack, maybe even King Queen. So I decided to bet 110 pounds thinking that, you know, I'm gonna be getting a lot of folds from a lot of the gut shots on the flop, the Queen Tens of the world, the Queen Jacks of the world. We'll still be getting called by Jack 10, which is not the worst thing in the world as we are, we are ahead of that hand for now. Also, there's a chance that we'll get a fold from a King and we'll probably get a fold from a nine or a six. So I thought given our equity in the pot and the fact that I didn't think we were gonna get raised too much in this spot, I really didn't feel like my opponents had much I thought the size would be good to try and try and negotiate our way into getting two faults. The button tankles. He takes a sweet time call in and I really believe that he had a legitimate decision. I was really debating what I was going to do on say like a blank deuce as the river offsuit seven hits me in the face. Now luckily yours truly has won many a Grammy and an Oscar. I think they're the acting ones for his wonderful displays of shaky hand syndrome as he's putting in the rest of his chips and I, I do take my time over it. Eventually I go all in for the remainder, 250 pounds of my opponent and I get snap called. And at first I was like, I guess it's a chop and then I remembered I'm playing one two. So I'm like, okay, actually it's probably not a chop. I probably, my read on the term was correct. And it was correct, he had king queen, so he says, he said he wasn't expecting me to turn up with the hand I had, he was more worried about ace king, and he looked really, really annoyed, but he took it like a champ, so congratulations to him for having a good temperament at least. And congratulations to us for scooping in the biggest pot of the night. It feels really good to win these pots for the Bancroft Challenge. I'm so excited about the fact that I can actually play in a casino now. Each one of these wins is so exhilarating to me. It feels better than when I've had like six or seven figure scores sometimes for this Bancroft Challenge because of the immense buildup I've had of not being able to play in casinos. It is so fun to be able to actually now battle it out and educate and inform at the same time as making a little bit of money for myself. So I hope you're enjoying the, the show so far. We've got a few more sick hands to go. I'm going to give a quick shout out to Paco, one of the Charmanders who uh, is always in my mind whenever I see the hand 6-9. God damn, he loves the hands. There's a straddle to five, hijack limps. We raised it up to 25 on the button, getting pretty out of line. 
and we get a fold. I'm just throwing that in there as well as to give a shout out to my friends. Uh, just to show that you can actually go really wide on the button to isolate people as long as you have a really good post flop reads or post flop edge and you can navigate in some dicey situations which you'll probably land in a lot of if you're opening hands or, or isolating hands like 9-6 suited. Okay, shit gets weird here. We are told that the player under the gun has straddled to 5. So we look down at King-10 offsuit in the small blinds and we bump it up. Standard play. Then we're told, actually bro, sorry it wasn't a straddle. He raised under the gun. So now suddenly yours truly is three betting 4x out of position, King-10 off small blind versus under the gun. Not a very good play. Not a very good play at all. It's not the worst. The player was very loose. So maybe if I had something like King Queen off, this would actually be pretty reasonable. And I might have actually still flat this, which is pretty insane uh, when you're playing against normal players. However, given my post up edge live reads and the fact that this guy's pretty loose, I don't mind playing this hand as a call. We play it as it is. We accept our fate and say, okay, well, it was my mistake for not paying enough attention. And we've made a 20 and the player calls. Now, at this point, I was actually pretty unsure whether he was just being polite and calling instead of four betting because he wanted to be reasonable and say, okay, well, we'll just put 20 in and play from there, or whether he just had a hand that wanted to call 20. It, judging by his, his demeanor, is actually a little bit uncertain to me. So the flop is eight, six, deuce. Remember to pause the video every now and again and work out what you would do and then compare it to my thought process. So my thought process here, here is that I want to be able to fold out a lot of his air, a lot of his, you know, just random like jack tens, king king jacks, hands like that. Um, and I'm also going to be setting up a double barrel on the turn. So a size that I would usually go in these kind of spots is relatively small, but not small enough that I'm going to induce some like random raises from something like pocket sevens. Uh, and as you can tell, I'm really thinking about all the parts of his range when I'm choosing a size and I go exactly 20. He throws in the call relatively quickly and the turn is a deuce bringing a flush draw. Sorry, can you lean, lean back? Sorry, sorry. Now you can hear me in the video asking the player next to me to lean back and that's so I can get a live read on the player and try and work out whether he's got a type of hand that he's willing to put all of his chips in the middle. Now, if I look at him and I think he's nutted, maybe he's got a set, maybe he's got a deuce, something like that. Maybe he's got something like pocket jacks or maybe something like pocket aces if he was doing something with pre-flop or perhaps I can give up and wave the white flag but that doesn't seem to be the case to me. So the second thing I do as a live specialist is to ask him how much he has in his stack. And I haven't been doing that too much throughout the day. And what I'm trying to do is imprint into his mind that I'm very, very willing to go all in on the river. That's what I do. I choose a size that looks like I could definitely go all in on the river. And what I'll be doing is I'll be giving up on a lot of kind of like low cards. So imagine, imagine the river is like a three. If he's sitting there with pocket sevens, there's no way he's going to look down me and just be like, oh, I think he's got an over there. He's always just going to call. So I'm going to be giving up on low cards and then probably shoving on something like an ace, a queen and a jack and then value betting on a king and a 10. Something along those lines would be my strategy. So I want to go pretty big on the turn to make him fold out a lot of his hands, maybe something like pocket threes, pocket fours, pocket fives. A lot of ace highs, things like that. Maybe even something as strong as an eight. Like people really do make some ludicrous folds in live poke when they think that all of their chips are gonna have to be in the middle. So we bet 57 and we get the fold. We got him, boys. It's a very standard spot from the outskirts of things. So you can look at this and say that these kind of spots just play themselves. But I put so much thought into my timing, into my sizing, into what I said. And I really do try and teach a conscious and cognizant way of playing poker. Every single spot is unique and every single spot deserves your full attention, including these relatively standard looking ones. As we get queen nine off on the button facing an under the gun limp from a recreational player, we decide to make it 12 pounds and the big blind, who's a, a reg, but you know, bear in mind, it's a, he's a one, two reg. He's, he's only been playing poker for a couple of years. So, you know, there's still gonna be a big disparity between him and us. He calls the big blind and the under the gun limper calls as well. The flop is king, king, queen, rainbow checks to us what are we gonna do what are we gonna do and why so i actually don't think there's any value to betting here this is the kind of board where first of all there's there's no value to protection the only bad turn cards would be an ace and also there's basically nothing to get value from under pairs might fold to any reasonable size bet ace high will probably fold to any reasonable size bet it's not like the board is seven seven six and we have something like 
you know, King six, where there are loads of overcards and Ace high will have more incentive to float and there's loads of overcards and there's basically nothing. So the only hands we'd really be trying to get value from would be something like gut shots and open-ended, specifically Jack 10. So I check behind for deception, planning to go for a double check strategy. As the turn is a five, we're sticking to our plan. It checks to us again. We might be able to induce some kind of bluff. It is a completely rainbow board. So I, I get the feeling that either somebody has something like pocket sevens, pocket sixes, pocket threes, or we're just gonna be up against two completely random hands that have no equity on this board. We check behind again for the same reasons that we check behind on the flop and the river is a deuce. It checks to us one more time. Now we can be almost certain that we have the best hand. It's reasonable for a king to be triple checking here to check raise but you have to ask yourself is the random one two recreational player or the new one two reg going to be thinking on that kind of level where it makes sense that we'd be checking behind some queen x on the the flop and turn to then you know bet the river i don't think they'd expect us to have that i think to be on the level above here we have to recognize that because we've checked twice it can look like we can just have loads of bluffs in a recreational's mind and we just have to represent one of those bluffs so choose a size what size would you go here and compare it to mine so it really does depend on your image and how you think people will perceive you to be bluffing how you think people will perceive you to be value betting this is actually one of those situations I think I would get more calls if I go a huge size than if I go like even like a third pot. A third pot just feels like I have some kind of pocket tens, pocket nines, something like that. An overbet, it's like from a recreational player's point of view, it's like, what is he really saying he has it? Is he saying he's rivered a boat? That doesn't make any sense. You know, you have to be in the level above. You can't be two or three or five level above. You have to be one level above. And I've played so many hands against people at this level that I feel I've got a good intuition for what level they're gonna be on. So we decide to go for the 50 pounds over bet, roughly about 1.6 X pot. The reg stares us down. He doesn't believe it for a second. We get the call, we show him the goods and we get the muck. Moving on to the next hand, feeling pretty damn good about that one. I gotta say, even these small pots still for the bankroll challenge, it's so exciting. It feels so good to be able to just battle it out at these streets. I will also say that this is good practice for me to start playing the EPT high rollers again. And it might not seem like it. The biggest challenge that I've been facing at casinos isn't the level of difficulty of the players I'm up against. It's actually just maintaining my energy throughout a day, throughout a session, not letting myself get tired or tilted or whatever it is. Casinos have really, really intense energy. And for somebody like I'm, I'm extraordinarily sensitive, it's actually really strengthening for me to be able to do this. I feel really excited to be back in a casino, back Battling on the streets and I really can't wait to be playing the high stakes again it's just going to be such an insanely good throwback and the the kind of pattern that I've usually gone for in the high stakes has been take a couple of years off play a big tournament bink let's see if we can keep it up we look down at pocket queens in the big blind now i will say the limpers a pretty nice person in general so i will at least look fake apologetic when we take all of our money in this hand let's bump it up to 25 pretty standard we don't want to go too big uh you know if she has something like eight six suited we definitely don't want her to fold if she has something like jack 10 off we don't want her to fold so i like 25 for something like queens kings and aces and then maybe a little bit bigger for something like ace king ace queen she calls and we look down at the dream flop 10 10 10 back in the day i used to bluff these boards like there's no tomorrow just a little hint if you're playing against weaker players and you want to bluff these boards try going small on the floor over bet on the turn <laughs> over bet on the river sometimes you can go over bet flop over bet turn over bet river if it's like deuce 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 uh, but you can really just represent having the over pair when they can't have something like that and just pray they don't have quads that's the key to it i decide to size down here to 15 i want to get a call from something like ace high king high uh queen high jack high pocket pairs like deuces threes fours I could probably go a little bit bigger in hindsight. And my thought process at the time is like, I think that I could even get a float from something along the lines of seven, eight suited, which we have drawing absolutely dead if I go this small. So I, I actually am torn between the size that I went and maybe something along the lines of 30. She calls and the turn is a king. Obviously not the best card in the deck. What are we gonna do? Or what are we gonna do and why?
so this is actually a really clear spot in my opinion we have to check we have to get her to bluff if she has something like eight six suited that she's floated on the flop something like jack nine that she's floated on the flop we have to check and allow them to bluff and then go into check call mode and see what happens on the river so we check and lo and behold she checks behind so it's time to start putting her on a range it really feels like she has a small pocket pair in my opinion or ace high if she's sitting there with something like pocket sixes when the river comes a nine i have to ask myself what size can i go to get value from that maybe she's rivered a nine maybe she's got something like pocket eights it really is dependent on who we are as well do we have a bluffy image do we have a tight image and of course i have the bluffiest image in the world even though this person didn't know who i was before we sat down loads of people have come up to me and said you know congrats for all the scores and things like that so she knows that i'm a very capable player and she's seen me bluff already throughout the day in smaller pots so it's time to size up when you have the very aggressive image you also have to be going for very big and very thin value in a lot of these kind of situations so i decide to go for an 85 pound bet i try to look as nervous as possible as i shakily put it in front of me we get around about a 10 second call we confidently table our hands and we get shown king five it's fucking king five of hearts is that even a backdoor flush? It's not even a backdoor flush or what have we done? We went the perfect size in the flop. We paid for it dearly. <laughs> oh man. So fair enough, if she's calling king five on the flop, who knows what else she's gonna be calling on the flop. It just so happens that she had three outs against us and then hit the three outs and then managed to check behind on the turn to probably lose a ton of value against us. Lo and behold, that's how poker goes sometimes. Don't worry about it. We move on to the next hand. Pretty happy with how we played it. So a new player sits down at the table. I just automatically get the sense that he's pretty good at poker. So I'm already putting him down as the second best player at the table apart from us, of course. Just the way that he was carrying himself, the way that he was holding his cards, handling his chips, he was deep stacked. And then I saw him play a couple of small pots. I just got that feeling. We did have pretty quick and pretty good reads on him. So I'm not afraid to play against him. We're sitting super, super deep now as the Aspers Casino has this rule where you can add on to the biggest stack. So he took his stack over from the other table and he was sitting like 1500 pounds deep. And at this point I realized that I wasn't doing the same. So I add on the rest of my money. I'm sitting there with a good chunky 1400 in front of us as we pick up kings in the small blind. Now this player has opened to 15 on the button. We're gonna three bet. Now he hasn't seen us three bet before so we can be completely unbalanced with our sizing here. I'd go bigger with ace king, I'd go bigger with blast, but with something like kings, I wanna keep in something like queen 10 or queen eight suited, something like that. So even though the GTO people on mine will tell you to go 75, 80, 85 here because we're so deep out of position, don't fucking listen to them. Think about how your hand plays in a vacuum in reality. And in this case, we want to get calls from weaker hands when we have such a big post flop edge and we have such a monster holding. So he calls and the flop comes jack eight three rainbow. First thing we have to be doing is asking ourselves what is our opponent's range on this board he can have 10 9 for an open ender he can have jack x for top pair he can have 8x for second pair he can have 3x for bottom pair sometimes some gut shots some over cards and some pocket pairs what are we going to do about that on these kind of boards i like to go really big in general with my value hands and pretty small with my bluffs i want to make him fold out his air if i have a bluff and i want to just maximize value against his gut shots open enders top pair and second pair and maybe something like tens and nines if I have a value hand. So that's what we do. We go 75. How did your sizing compare to mine? Think about it, please be conscious. I don't want to sound like your dad by reminding you of all these things too much, but please play poker consciously. So Jack A3, we go 75 pounds. We get a 10 second call from our opponent. The turn comes a queen. Now this is not a great turn. If we think that our pre-flop assumptions are true, he can have queen eight suited. He can definitely have queen jack off suit and he can definitely have 10 nine suited, maybe even 10 nine off suit. So this really isn't the dream. I look at my opponent and I'm unsure if he's hit it or not. It doesn't it looks like it's definitely possible that you could hit it. Although sometimes it's quite easy to get mixed up between whether someone's hit it or whether they recognize it's a good car for their range, they might stop bluffing. So I decided to put on the brakes and give him a check. So he checks behind relatively quickly, making us feel like we have the best hand almost 100% of the time. And the river is a jack. Again, not an ideal card, but I did spend a lot of time looking at him on the turn and I look at him again on the river and I feel like nothing's really changed. You know, he still looks relatively engaged in the pot. It still felt like he had something, but now I was just putting him on something like a queen, 
because nothing changed between the turn and the river and if he's excited on the turn and he's still excited on the river it just makes sense for him to have something like queen 10 so based on that assumption i gave it maybe 50 percent more weighting of the queen x and we decide to go for some value what size would you go given if you think my assumptions are fair what size would you like to go? I go pretty chunky. 225. 225 to go, my friends. And we try and, as always, look as nervous, but subtly nervous, because he's a thinking player, as humanly possible. We get an Emmy, we get an Oscar, and we're feeling pretty damn smart about ourselves when he announces... Raise. Fuck. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And I almost just snap fold in this spot. I, I, I picked up my cards and I was like, you got it. And I was like, wait a second. I want to make sure. Because in all of my time playing poker, every single cell in my body thinks that this is always value. When you bet huge on the river, you can personally have a very strong hand. And then when a recreational, potentially professional poker player playing one, two raises on a river in this kind of spot, it just feels so value heavy. So our opponent is raised to around 1,050, maybe 1,100. And this is a huge raise. And this is just another reason to think that it's a value hand. Almost never see people go this big as a bluff, especially again, when I can have quite a few of the nodded hands myself. I spend the next minute just making sure it's a really high equity spot you know if I throw away a winning hand here it's so bad for my long-term EV so I have to be making 100% sure I get the player talking I get him smiling he looks as comfortable as comfortable can be and eventually we get the live read that he just has it after he says something very specific which I'm not gonna say and we make the fault he's kind enough to tell us that he had 10-9 for the turn straight 100% believe him he wasn't the kind of person to be lying just for the sake of it and we were going to be leaving soon. Shout out to that guy for being honest and shout out to that guy for being able to fucking turn us out of existence. Congratulations. So I put the rest of the money that I had with me on the table. So now we're sitting with about 1.4k and we do actually trickle down, lose quite a few small hands over the next hour. And I'm realizing that my energy has kind of dropped. I'm not feeling as excited. I don't think I prepared my diet as well as I could have. I did eat really healthy, but I don't think I ate enough. And because of that, I was feeling not quite as cognizant as I was before. So this is now my last orbit as we look down at 10, nine off in the hijack. Now, how the fuck are we gonna VPIP this when we see an open from mid position to 15 and then a call from the low jack? How are we gonna VPIP this? Well, we're definitely not gonna be flatting it. We're a million big blinds deep with both players. We've got great live reads. I'm gonna put this one down to tired brain and just kind of doing it because it's funny, but I'd strongly recommend not doing this at home. We bump it up to 65 pounds. Last orbit, please let's not punt off a whole stack after we've been sitting here for a good three hours. The flop comes ace jack five rainbow, the dream, the dream boys. We at least got an ace high flop and backdoor straight drops. <laughs> it's not ideal. However, the reason that I, in the moment that I decided to three bet this is because I'm sitting in position to two players that I actually had phenomenally good live reads on. I look over and I spent probably a good 30 seconds, which I get can be kind of annoying to be stared down in such a small pot relative to the game but I really wanted to see whether my C bet was gonna be profitable or not. And when you stare at people, they tend to do things that will give away a lot of information, especially when it's not kind of situation where you'd expect to be stared at, always looking for the way that people react in these kind of spots. Eventually we get the read from both players that neither of them have a nutted hand. So my plan is clear, my plan is simple. Let's blast off and see where it goes. Can you guess what's gonna happen in this hand? That's right, we make an unconventional 75 pound C bet and get two tank forwards. Let's fucking go. Ended it on a punt and it wasn't quite as punty as it could have been. It wasn't the craziest hands that we've ever played, but a lot of them are very interesting. And it's left me really feeling confident about the bankroll challenge. The 1-2 game at the Spaspus Casino actually plays more like maybe even like a 2-4, 2-5 kind of game. And when it's this deep stacked for such a long time, we're gonna see some huge pots over the time. I would really recommend you guys come down to see the Spaspus Casino. It's really chilled atmosphere. Like I was told by other people that it was just gonna be like a really tight game, kind of annoying to play in, but it was one of the loosest one, two games that I've ever played in. So shout out to the Aspers, I mean Spaspus Casino, and shout out to the person that says, I'm not allowed to film here, but I'm gonna tell all of the staff to look the other way 
God bless you, Paul. God bless you. So just one last announcement. If you haven't seen my previous video, I am now actually engaged to the beautiful, to the gorgeous love of my life, my equal, my opposite, my life partner, Hannah Lussenden. And we shared a little bit of our phenomenally big story on my last YouTube video. If you want to go see that, it's just a lot of love. It's a lot of fun just to share a little bit of personal vulnerability on one of these poker videos. I've never been happier and the level of care and trust and fun and joy and love that we have within our family dynamic right now is beyond what I actually thought was possible in, in life. And I'm so grateful that I found somebody who can make my heart sing in all of these ways. And then on a little bit of a soppy, vulnerable, authentic note, I hope you guys have love in your life as well. And if you don't, I hope you cultivate love into your life and you're not just always grinding and always thinking about poker and always in your head. I hope you spend enough time in your heart and your body and uh, relaxing into what life is really about, which is more than anything, just enjoying yourself. Much love, you beautiful souls. I hope to see you again on the next one. Let's turn this 10K into 100K and then let's turn that 100K into a million and then let's spunk it on blackjack. Just kidding. I love you. Peace.